back then getting those TV commercials was actually pretty good money. You know, you would audition and and you, you go get into a Mountain Dew commercial or some car company and you get residuals on TV and you would go to these auditions and often there would be Tony Hawk in there auditioning for the skate part and like some BMXer would be in there and they would everybody would show up and then <laughs> But then there were also these Hollywood models who would kind of look good and can do it all and check the boxes and and you would like listen to their interview and they like would be in there in front of the camera going like, okay, I'm so-and-so and I'm downhill world champion. And it's like, you haven't never even raced, dude. <laughs> <laughs> This is a legend in the truest form. For as long as I've been mountain biking, I can't think of someone who represents mountain biking more. I can't even think of mountain biking without this person. That's right. It's Hans No Way Ray. Round of applause. Oh, yeah. Right. That was good, wasn't it? That was good. Wow, that was, that was more than I deserve, I tell you. That. <laughs> it's an honour and a privilege to have you on here. Absolutely. It really That's why it's with your podcast. It's... I've been enjoying them. Mate, you said on the way here, this was the highlight of your career. But <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but if that's, you know, if, if that's you, yeah, if, 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 then if, if that's how it came out, you know, I'm not going to take it away. It was like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Super hyped to have you on. Yeah. I mean, um, first and foremost, can we quickly, just quickly talk about your tour coming up? Yeah. I think it's worth getting out of the way and talking about it before we delve into things. I think so. I agree. Because I've been to, I went to, I think it was not your last tour, the tour before, I think I went to. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. came. You came. That was cool. Yeah. I, obviously, there must be a reason why I came to England in February. Dude. So, <laughs> Dude, yeah. And yes, we're doing a, another talk tour, a brand new talk. It's called Mishaps and Mayhem. We're going to 16... Uh, locations or venues all over the UK, mm -hmm. mainly in England, some in Wales and a couple in Scotland. Um, and basically, yeah, all of March. So it starts March 5th in Andover and then it ends in Shrewsbury at the end of March. Beautiful. Mate, amazing. Tickets are still available. Uh, just get that out there now. We'll put a link in the show description so yeah. people can still get tickets. Yeah, you can go to my website or and Speakers from the Edge. They're okay. promoting it like always and you can buy the ticket and I would book them right now because you can choose your seats and stuff and it's yeah. it, also, right the it also helps us to know that some people are coming and you do not speaking in front of an empty room. <laughs> no, but um, it's, it's, it's cool and it's, it's, it's fun and, and I'm still like, polishing the, t the new talk and stuff and we're telling a few stories that we usually don't tell people about okay. uh, in this and kind of the lighthearted side but there's a lot of really cool career highlights like uh, cool trips we've done and yeah. background stories and so on you know it should be a I, good laugh i took a lot from your tour i did i i, I went in thinking well i'm a fan of hands around of course i'm gonna go to the the talk tour, but I actually sat there and I was like looking around and I was thinking, wow, this is a room captivated. This is a room like completely, they're all in. You're there for an hour listening to you, you talk about your life. Like, and it's, yeah, that they're, they're all fans of yours, but also you've had a very interesting time of it, mm. haven't you? Yeah, there have been some cool stories to tell and it's, yeah, it was, it was like a really good audience and appreciative. And I was surprised myself when, when we first planned this talk tour. You know, these talks are quite common in the mountaineering world and these kind of people who travel around the world. But mountain biking back then, nobody had done one. And, and I was like thinking, who would, in the middle of Wales somewhere, who would come, who would even know me? And who would come and pay like money for a ticket? And sometimes people drive four or five hours to get there and then they stand in line and they, you know, meet and greet and all that. We have some merchandise, but, but it, was, it was quite humbling and nice and people telling you their stories, how they got into biking and how their first bike was a Saska and, and like literally sometimes the grandfather and the father and the son and the three generations now of GT riders or so. And it's kind of nice to hear these stories. So, so and you hear more than usual at a talk like this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's mega. I mean, you talk about three generations of GT riders. Is 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 it right? This is your thirty seventh year on GT yeah. on one brand. I know, I dude. That's <laughs> absolutely incredible. That's it's like amazing. It deserves a round of applause. I think that's <laughs> so cool. It does. I think that. Yeah, it's just me. 
Yeah, but yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, sorry, that's, that's a full <laughs> Whenever there's a new boss coming in, I go like, "Oh, and by the way, I come with the inventory." <laughs> Part of the furniture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it says something, man. It says something. I think like to remain relevant over that period of time, like that's really hard work. Mm. What do you put it down to? Sheer luck. No, <laughs> um, I don't know. It's yeah. There's some, you know, you. you Loyalty goes both ways, you know, and GT has been a loyal sponsor for me for a long time. And yeah, they went a bit up and down over the years, you know, they've been sold and there was other stuff. And But right now we have a whole new team and we kind of revamping the whole brand. We're going full on IBD again, like with bike shops, not no discount stores and all that. And we have a brand new line of bikes coming up. We have a, a new boss who has a really good attitude and understands the bike industry. So, but... For me, it was always like, I didn't want to go fishing around. Can I get a few more bucks here or there? I was happy with GT. And and I just like, you know, it was a mutual partnership, you know. And and I think it's also, yeah, it shows a lot for GT to show that loyalty over all these years, you know. So, mm. um, I mean, the, the only guy I really know who has been longer with a main sponsor in the action sports world is Steve Caballero. Yeah, who rides mountain bikes now? Well, he rides a lot of mountain bikes, but yeah. as his, for his sponsors, you know, he's been with his skateboard sponsor, Paul Peralta, and with Vans Tennis Shoes for like, like I think 45 years. He just wow. s- 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 something like <sighs> That's crazy. Unreal. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I was so hyped when I found out he rode mountain bikes. Yeah. I used to, um, his shoes were like the shoes I would buy. And then I, I was thinking about it the other day and I clicked on his profile. And he was there riding mountain bike. He's like hitting jumps and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's Maryland really into too. it. I, I, I I've ridden no with idea. him a bunch of times. Yeah, That's so sick. Yeah, we even yeah, uh, and he's he's into it. He rides all the time. He's he's also into motocross quite a bit. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, he's. How has it, it changed for you at GT over thirty-seven years? And oh, what? Man, yeah. What does your role look like now? Because straight away you're talking about the brand as a whole. You're talking about going back into IBDs and the what the the plan of the brand looks like moving forward? Like, how involved are you in all that? You know, I, I'm more like on the sidelines. I'm I'm still, like, really, and call, we call it an ambassador, one of the writers, really. You know, I still generate exposure for them. That's one of my big jobs, the, you mm. know, the you know, do, you know, obviously I, I don't race anymore or do any of that stuff, which I've initially done for them. But... I do these adventure trips, like my urban adventures and all these other s- activities and PR stuff, and that sh- still generates, like, you know, I, I create content too, you know, and, you know, as we all know, there's no age limit to mountain biking. Yes, you know, like, yes, it's it's driven, the core scene is more younger generation, but if you look at the people who buy the bikes, you know, it's often my age, my generation who spends 10,000 quid on an e-bike or, you know, or or go on a mountain bike holiday or do all that. And so I have, I still have a lot of, I have a lot of long-time sponsors like Adidas and 510. I've been with them for 30 years, 31 years. And Shimano, I've been with over 30 years. And so a lot of my, my relationships are long-term and we, yeah, we, we work together. and, And I think maybe part of the reason is I, I was lucky or I, I had the vision to do a few things before other people didn't done them, you know, including the really the content creation of things and videos. But I was also maybe um, they didn't I didn't need babysitting, I think, what sometimes sponsors tell me, you know, like they, mm. they can they can they know I if if they don't do anything with me, I'll still make sure I'll be busy active, and do yeah. stuff, you know, and. Do you think yeah. that's a result of not um, of like sort of chilling out on competing? Do you think it's like so you stopped competing? Do you, did you sort of feel like you had to offer something more? Is that where the hustle came from? Do you think it came even while I was competing? I was already doing as a trials guy. You know, you do trial shows and then you reach a whole different audience, and then you go again to a trials competition and you're in the middle of a, of some woods somewhere <laughs> where no spectators and yeah. nobody is, and or a downhill race even for that matter, and and you know like and i was bringing the sport to the people you know and and there was a time when all these sports were kind of new these action sports and you and the <coughs> media was interested in that too you know like i mean you put a cross country guy in a tv studio he cannot really show much 
but you bring a trials guy and he jumps over your furniture and and does stuff you know and i had that kind of going for myself and mm. and you know like when we did my first video that opened really my eyes or some of these other pr stunts i done you know like taking my trial skills and hopping over a taxi cab in new york city for a swatch ad that really that, that really that yeah. really opened my eyes like to my oh my god you know like use my trial skills outside of a competition and and all of a sudden like you know it's something cool and different and you know and from then from that day on i started looking at the world with different eyes because everything became a, a potential obstacle i could write <laughs> over or do a photo shoot yeah. with and and so yeah it's 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 an it's a number of those kind of things that kind of just fell into place the swatch ad came up a minute ago we went to mb yeah and i was like guys you're gonna like this we've got hans ray coming into the bike <laughs> shop and instantly um ben was like we need to i think it was ben or maybe tom he's like we need to print off the the one of him hopping on the car and it was the swatch ad it was exactly that what was what was that was that in new york was it or is it downtown la yeah that was i was i was pretty lucky when when i came to america in 87 the guy who invited me he was national trials champ but Trials is really a European sport, bicycle trials. Mm -hmm. and, and also motorcycle trials obviously started here in England. And, and, but BMX and mountain biking are obviously American sports. But in the early mountain bike races in America, they had always trials as one of the disciplines. So it's three disciplines, right? Yeah, literally, you had, they yeah. called it a stage race. So okay. everybody in a mountain bike race had to do a cross country, a downhill, and the trials on the same bike, in the, and all on 26-inch old-school mountain bikes. Mm. But there was a small <coughs> scene starting in America with 20-inch guys, and they would look over to the Europeans and come over and compete in the European Championships. And, and this guy, Kevin Norton, said, come to America. There's a new sport. It's called mountain biking, and show them what real trials is. So I figured, hey, I was just about to retire from, from bike riding and trials riding, you know, and go to university. No way. And, and I took an, a vacation semester. <laughs> And went to America, I figured that would be a great way to end my career as a trials rider. I was like a, a top 10 rider in Europe for probably 10 years. And and went to America and it's just like the floodgates opened, you know. And this Kevin Norton guy, he really introduced me to everything and everybody from, you know, I, I was never a BMXer, but I always looked at the BMX magazines and I couldn't believe all these guys. He's a rider sponsor, driving Porsches, you know, 16-year-old oh, yeah. kids and... And I get to go over there, and literally in the first week, I was at the production for BMX Plus magazine where they did a video production with everybody in it. All the all the writers <laughs> you could think of were there at the shoot, you know. So it properly felt like Hollywood. It yeah, and, like. and it's like all this happened. Then he introduced me to the Laguna Rats, you know, these original mountain bike club from California, one of the oldest clubs, and who I still ride with today. And then and and then literally one morning the phone rang and. The guy goes like, um, yeah, we were in L.A., well, near L.A., and the guy was like, um, we need two trials riders in New York this afternoon, tickets are at the airport. We drove straight to the airport, flew to New York, and the next day they said, yeah, we want you to, to jump over this taxi cab or so, and, and I did this, I didn't, I didn't really, I mean, yeah, I rode over it too, but I, I did, the picture looks like I'm flying over it, but all I did was a bunny hop on the roof oh. on, on one spot and landed on the same spot, but when I'm up there in the air, it looks like I'm, <laughs> I'm flying over the car. So anyway, so that, that was a, a famous, it was part of a big ad campaign, print ads in those days. And and that opened the door to Swatch sponsorship. Then okay. Swatch at the time didn't do just watches. They did also clothing. And I said, hey, I can wear your clothing. And that was kind of also, nobody really wore street clothes back then. Mm -hmm. You know, even the BMX, I still had BMX uniforms on, you know, that it started to change right there and then when Vision Streetwear came on and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so that, so that was a, a sponsorship for almost 20 years that, you know, that started out with that photo shoot, really. Wow. So, so who had the foresight to get the trials rider involved? Was it Swatch? Or an agency? Yeah, I think they. I think it was an agency and the photographer, and they called up a mountain bike magazine at the time called, called Mountain Biking, and they they called Kevin up, he, and you know who was the the trials guy in America, and and you know you have to give Swatch credit. They were they paved the way for Red Bull. I mean, really, yeah. I mean Red Bull 
Red Bull came way later than Swatch. Swatch sponsored all these action sports, like from freestyle skiing to skateboarding, BMX, trials. And even I had a little connection with Swatch before I came to America, and that was kind of independently. But, you know, that was that call was different, you know, from New York. But, mm. but they sponsored the Bicycle Trials European Cup in 85 in Germany already. You know, like long before even, you know, like, mountain biking even started or and red bull probably came 15 years later or mm -hmm. at, at least like on the on the bigger scale and at the beginning i remember red bull uh, tagged on to some swatch events you know as a co-sponsor you know and they really literally said oh, we can only like copy what you can but then now they took it on the whole next level and sport swatch eventually got out of extreme sport at least temporary mm -hmm. but um they they really like when nobody wanted to have anything to do with action sports they were they were there so wow. did you just what what did it feel like you felt like you just landed in the middle of something super exciting in mountain biking in la and i don't know what hit me i i couldn't really i didn't you know i didn't have expectations and you know like and i really landed at the right place i mean i wasn't in laguna beach where i live now but right in the town next to it and in Southern California, in the middle of all this, I mean, and I got to um, rub elbows with all these other scenes, the action sports, and I, yeah. they influenced me a lot. But, you know, like I said, I, I got to do shows with all these BMX freestylers, with skateboarders, like, like you know, like Rodney Mullen and like Rob Roskop, oh. Natas Kaupas. We would do shows together, you know. They were also writing for Swatch. Right. And I would... I would then like the surf industry is there. Then, then I kind of got a little bit involved in the skiing world. Not that I was a skier, but I would be in a production with skiers, or I would work with a ski filmmaker, or and and it was just like it was. It was amazing, you know, to see all these little worlds collide. And Southern California is really the place to be, you know, and. Mm. And so there was definitely some opportunities. Yeah. Do you have an agent back then who was figuring this out? Like, no, I was always trying to get one, and I couldn't find one really. Okay. That was, and sometimes I worked with somebody shortly, but, and I I learned to do it myself, and I I I figured at the end, you know, eventually I figured I can, because either you had an agent who, who didn't understand the sport, mm. or you had, but had contacts, or vice versa, somebody you know. You know, so I did a lot myself, and often I wish I, you know, you don't have to, blow, tr you know, blow your own trumpet, you know, all the time, you know, which you have to do kind of when you manage yourself, or at least you have to show people what you do and and talk about it to a degree. But um, so for me, it was always agentless, even though I, sometimes I wish I had one. So mm. with amongst pro riders, your uh, book is like famous. Yeah, it is. It is like so like many people have mentioned Hans it. Maybe not on the himself. podcast. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. When we've been talking yeah. to people, there's no good. It's no good because quite often you see sort of like um, frustration, especially with social media. People approaching people and they just like uh, like I mean, when I've worked for brands and had the login, you see uh, the approach for sponsorship is so kind of half assed It's just a a message, <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, that compared to your approach to sponsorship. Um, actually giving someone um, what they're actually going to get in return, kind of. Yeah, so you're talking about the book I do at the end of the year to yeah. show my sponsors what I've done for them. And and maybe, yeah, maybe that is one of those reasons from the earlier question why I've been around so long because, you know, I know it saved my, my ass a few times, literally. Like, I remember there was a time at... So I do this book and I put photocopies and back then it was a lot of magazine cup you know, copies right. of magazine articles. When did with, you start doing it? Photo. What year is this when you started doing that? Uh, I, I did it already on a small scale. On a, on a small scale, I did it probably already in... Even in the, in the early 90s, you had a little portfolio thing, you know, or even late 80s. But I, I did it, the big book I have, I, I think they go back to about 
98 or so really? when I started doing this this big format book and it's it's like a phone book almost and and then it has statistics in it not just co photocopies and then it has the, now the digital stuff it has statistics about your Instagram account and followers and and it has like the TV stuff I did lists all the because a lot of these adventures I do they they are shown on TV TV stations all over the world and yeah. and collecting all that. I mean, it's one thing to get all that exposure. It's another thing to collect it and then to put it into a format. And and like you say, some some sponsors tell me they use that book to show it to other athletes mm. and to say, hey, this is kind of because like some company. This is the bar. <laughs> yeah. yeah, some companies <laughs> would tell me we don't get that from Lance Armstrong and his team. You know, like yeah. and and. And it, like I said, like one time in Adidas, there was a time when they were big in mountain biking and, and, and all that and cycling and BMX and they had the T-Mobile team and a new boss came in and he said, we're going to cut everything except the T-Mobile team in uh, cycling wise. And my boss was like, yeah, but we have Hans Ray. He's been already with us at the time, like whatever, 15 years. Or, and he put my book on the table and the guy looks through the book for 20 seconds and he goes like, well, for that, we still have money, you know, <laughs> yeah. but that's like one example where I know it's, it literally saved me, you know, and if yeah. often athletes, I think, assume people should know, don't he, doesn't he know that I just like won this race or mm. got, you know, like that my, my, my post went viral or that I, that I was in this magazine and, and back then you could actually probably keep your finger on the pulse, but of what was going on. But nowadays it's almost impossible with yeah. all that stuff. So, so you have to kind of, you know, and it's almost a job in itself to, col you know, to keep track of this, you know, some sponsors, they want to pay you based on, you know, bonuses, you know, and, and it's like, it's more work to, to figure out the bonuses than to actually f mm. figure out how to go viral. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I actually think I started doing it because I heard of your book and then I found it such a good exercise Like because it's easy to think, God, what have I done? And then you put it together and you're like, yeah, actually, I've done a proper job. You know yeah. what I mean? It like gives you, uh, it gives you your own worth as well as showing your worth to sponsors, I feel like. Yeah, it gives you. It, it can give you also negotiation power because sometimes it's like, why do we sponsor this guy? And is he really selling? It's sometimes hard to say what what does it do for a company. You know, yeah, it's very rarely that you have one of these superstars like in in football. You know, when they sign Messi, they are selling like you know yeah. like hundreds of thousands of jerseys Instantly. the next day. You know, yeah. but but in cycling, there's only very few people who have that. Oh since we signed him our sales yeah. doubled you know it's hard to say so so but you um mm. i forgot what i was going going with <laughs> but i'm interested in the tv time because oh. i think like we, we, do you remember it yeah no I, I was going to say for example one once early on in my career i had this weird sponsor like in 92 i got this clutch company look look, look yeah, clutches we it, uk yeah. was that big yellow patch and they sponsored me also for over 25 years and they were car clutches. But um, that year, the German bike magazine, <laughs> mountain biking was just taking off in Germany, the bike magazine. They said, we're going to do a how-to series with you um, over the next eight months, every month, like eight pages or so. And I could go to a company like this and go like, hey, I have 54 pages guaranteed in this magazine where an ad costs like... 10 grand, you know, a month, you know, a, a yeah, page, yeah. you know, yeah. and like a company like this can go like, oh, wow, this, you know, I can actually justify that easily, not to mention all the other stuff that's going on throughout the year and the, mm. the, the life impressions and the fact that they can use you for stuff. So, I mean, print was great. Print was great for our job. It was so quantifiable, I yeah. think. Yeah. Well, yeah, and it's the same now. I mean, those guys who have the successful YouTube channels for them, it's it's a bit bit similar, you know. Numbers talk, really. You yeah, know? you are right. You are right. It's something about print. Felt like there was when there was front covers. There's twelve in a year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It yeah. Was something like so easy to understand. Like you, you are exactly right about YouTube and about social media still being quantifiable, but like print was just. It still feels good. And then you come yeah. across, you know, you come across about an old magazine from 20 years ago when you like go through your drawers here and, and you go like, oh, this is cool, you know? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you don't come across a 20-year-old Instagram post, you know <laughs> what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. That is so true. Oh, yeah. Maybe so, one day. Yeah, exactly. I'm really interested in TV because that, that seems to me, so you were in LA for a bit, 
you're in what I can only imagine feels like Hollywood. If got mustard, did it feel pretty crazy back then? Yeah, yeah. And then you become involved in TV. How did that happen? Well, that was just like, you know, you're near Hollywood and every once in a while they needed like somebody to do a bicycle stunt for a commercial or so. And back then getting those TV commercials was actually pretty good money. You know, you would audition and and you, you go get into a Mountain Dew commercial or some car company and you get residuals on TV and you would go to these auditions and often there would be Tony Hawk in there auditioning for the skate part and like some BMX that would be in there and they would everybody Sorry, would show up and then... <laughs> But then there were also these Hollywood models who would kind of look good and can do it all and check the boxes and, and you would like listen to their interview and they like would be in there in front of the camera going like, okay, I'm so-and-so and I'm downhill world champion. And it's like, you haven't never even raced, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, those parts were given to whoever looked the part, you know. Okay. But um, but so, yeah, so that's that opened some doors and then... Initially, and that was even in Germany, I got I, you got invited quite on some of these talk shows, TV shows, where you sh show something, and they just love to see some some action, you know, even though it wasn't defined yet, and 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 that'll be massive then, yeah, like mainstream TV. Yeah, I did a, I did a GT. really, you know, th that TV show. Uh, what was it called in the UK? You bet, right? You bet. Oh yeah. Where people bet that celebrities sit there and they bet that somebody can do something. And Steve Warner did that as well, didn't he? Yeah, they did it. Yeah. I think he did it years later. Yeah. I was I was doing it in '87, actually, <laughs> two weeks before I went to America. Wow. And I mean, get this. I mean, we all talking Instagram or or, or YouTube numbers, and yeah. I remember like when when Danny's video like his first video reached 40 million or so, I was like, wow, you know, six months and you have 40 million. But I was in a, this TV show and we had 41 million viewers live in one go. <laughs> that was when there only was three channels. Yeah. Oh, and all the, and this, this show was so popular, this particular show. And all the neighboring countries from Switzerland, Denmark, you know, Holland, they would all watch that show. And it was just like, you know, Jane Fonda was a guest and, you know, like really big proper celebrities and I did a bet where they they bet that I could ride a bike there was four four balance beams put to a square hmm. and I, you know like about a meter high and and I would ride my bike around that square but nobody could picture how the bike gets around the corner you know like right. and I would hop it around the corner and and I got really like I was really like that was a huge Actually, probably still to this day, the biggest thing I've done. I mean, that's so many people. <laughs> but then I literally went to America and I didn't really cash in on that success because I could have done a lot of trial shows after that and I was really known in Germany after that. And I think that's the thing. Did it actually like um, carry over into other countries? Because now in 40 Europe, million, when, like, if you've seen 40 million, like with Danny on YouTube, that's a global 40 million. Yeah. Where if you've got a German 40 million. So were you like going out on the street and people are noticing you, but then you go to America and people don't... Yeah, it was exactly like that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, no, nobody in America ever heard of that TV show, you know, yeah. but in Germany, like, I mean, it, that basically meant that every other person in Germany watched that show, you know, and... Yeah. and um, what was so it? that was... Did that you actually see and feel that? Like, been out and about? Yeah, you know, I didn't, not long enough, because literally two weeks later, I went to America and okay. I kind of, I didn't, like... You know, take advantage, or take advantage. You know, like yeah, I didn't really, you know, but it was it was a cool, it was a cool milestone. But but being a trial guy, you often could do TV stuff, yeah. and then you could, and then later, I my videos would end up on TV or my adventure trips. We would make documentary films, and then and then there was the cheesy Pacific Blue TV show where I did a lot of stunt work. Yes, and that oh, was kind Blue. of as, as Hollywood as it Where's got. Where's Sessler for me. on that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Cassie and a few people that you would know. I mean, here and there, like, I was quite regular, but then Wayne Grossdale did stuff on it. Lopes was in the odd op episode and Lee Donovan. Eddie Fiola, he was the, right. the king of freestyle, you know, back at BMX freestyler. He was actually quite a big stuntman and still is in Hollywood, like, after his BMX career. But he had also quite a few parts in it, but... So we did stunt work doubling the Santa Monica bike police uh, cops and okay. also the bad guys sometimes, you know, and there was chases yeah. on bikes and very cheesy, but <laughs> the, the show was huge, you know, like yeah. 100, it aired in over 100 countries, you know, yeah. so it was, it was a, it was kind of a, 
And I got to actually play myself in two of the episodes as, oh, really? as like Hans Ray, the, the evil Eastern European bike <laughs> coach, and I had this rivalry <laughs> with, with one of the one of, one of the uh, the cop actors. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like as well. So there was like a flipping in with your career around 1989, where you did the Swatch commercial. Before that, though, like what was your career like? Like were you a competitive trials rider? Yeah. And how did you get make that bridge to then being on TV? How well, did that actually happen? So, so I was a, a trials rider in Europe means you're an amateur. If you're one of the best guys, like, you know, like, like where I was, you would maybe get a free bike a year yeah. from some sponsorship and have maybe a clothing sponsor. And we would make a little pocket money with trial shows, you know, like at, at city festivals, at car dealerships, at, at stuff like this. And, and that was it. Mm. And, and then when I came to America, you know, like... And, I meant to just go there for a few months and then go back to university, but then I got this GT contract. Okay. And they offered me a, a little money to pay rent, and then Swatch gave me a contract, and and then I started making money from trial shows, especially when Swatch sent me on tour with with all these guys. And so I was like, hmm, this is pretty cool. Maybe I stay a little bit longer. And you know, out of one year became two years, and and. The sport hadn't really exploded yet, you know, and it was hard. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that easy, like, oh, I'm living the life. I was, like, getting pressure from home, like, what are you going to do when this is all over and you don't have a bloody proper education or, you know, I never learned the job, like I didn't do an apprenticeship, anything, and and there was some pressure, and that's maybe why I became kind of business-oriented in a way that I better make this work, you know, yeah. and I never would have thought that I would make this for the rest of my life. I, I still always thought I'm doing it two or three more years, but the connections I have through Swatch and through, you know, being in America and stuff would maybe help me, you mm -hmm. know, and I would eventually go into marketing or do something like this. And so, yeah, so that's, you know, and that Swatch thing was literally early on. It was in 87. And then okay. and that kind of made me a, a professional. It wasn't, wasn't big money, really, but there was enough to live and to kind of, for me, it was more like a way to come to America learn the language, see the, see the country. And then, yeah, and then you got, like I said, you, you got involved with that whole action sports scene. And it was so yeah. so cool to, to meet all these people. And it was just like, nobody had an agenda. It was just like they were doing what they loved. You know, you know everybody their own thing, be it a surfer or a skater. Or a, and there was often tough times for these sports. I remember yeah. the skaters went through some, you know, skating used to be big and then it was... Right then, it got really, was rock bottom. There was like hardly anybody, I mean, all those guys, even Tony Hawk, they were like s struggling for sponsorships and that's in, and all that. And Right, so that's and why they do more yeah. TV work and stuff. Yeah, exactly, or do whatever it takes, yeah. The, yeah. And then all of a sudden, when the X Games came, and that was on, in 95, but yeah. trials was one of the disciplines in the very first X Games. Oh, right. And so I was that, mountain yeah. biking had two disciplines, had slalom and giant slalom. They kind of invented giant slalom <laughs> just like in the snow biking thing <laughs> where they, you know, it fit TV <laughs> format, you know. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so that, I was in the first X game doing the slalom oh, and, the, and the trials. And, so good. and that was cool because wow. the first the X game was it was really something new and it was really cool that ESPN took that on and it was co actually called Extreme Games in the first year. Right. But they picked one guy from each sport um, who was kind of the, the poster boy. And I happened to be that guy for the trials on the mountain biking thing. But Matt Hoffman was one, the one for BMX. Tony Hawk was the one for skating. And there was like yeah. a few other guys from, and they would like send us around the country for press conferences and stuff. And they would do features leading up, come to our home, do a home story on TV. And, and that year leading up to the X Games, there was a strike for major, uh, major league baseball and hockey was striked. I remember that. So I there was no strike. season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was over pay, wasn't it? So they didn't know what to put on TV, so they, they played my videos all day long and stuff, and it was, like, amazing. <laughs> you know, like, literally, like, I remember on Thanksgiving, we turned on the TV, and there's, like, my videos playing twice, two times in a row on ESPN, you know? And, and so that was a big, that was a big thing, and that really lifted the sport up, and that brought, that brought kind of skateboarding and BMX out of the doghouse again, really, and these yeah. sports could... There was a big flourish. buzz then, wasn't there? Yeah. yeah. Like even the name Extreme 
Like yeah. that, like that, that kind of came there. It was so exciting. It was like it's extreme. It's yeah. new. It's dangerous. It's wow. Yeah. yeah, and it was. Where was the first X Games held at? They were in uh, Rhode I Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. But the trials, and that's where how our federation at the time, which was called Norba, that was before the UCI was involved. The 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 trials and the mountain biking, they insisted it had to be in the mountains. So they t took it two hours away uh, to Vermont, Mount Snow, which was a famous mountain biking venue at the time. And we rode there during the week with no spectators. So yes, it was televised. Right. But everything else was happening down in Newport, Rhode Island, and we kind of missed out. And, and at the time, if you believe it or not, mountain biking was the most professional out of all the sports involved. There was rock climbing in there, even bungee jumping. There was inline skating. Street luge? Inline skating, street luge, I think, yeah. was in there. There were some weird ones in there, but but we were the most professional. And they didn't really like the fact that everybody had so much sponsor logos on because some of them, like the Volvo Cannondale team, right. Volvo was competing against Chevy, who sponsored the X Games. And, and they, you know, like they made us wear these bibs. And the mountain bikers were very demanding. And they made it very difficult. And, and I think the X Games were like, you know, these guys are a headache. Um, let's like drop mountain biking. And then they put it in the winter uh, X Games. Okay. The Winter X Games probably started two or three years later. Mm. And they said, let's put mountain biking in there. If they really want their mountains, they can have them. And they, <laughs> they started racing on snow and no trials anymore, but they, they did downhill or whatever it was. Or slalom. Trials in the snow would be tough. That'd be <laughs> yeah. a tough watch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but so that's that was kind of the end for mountain biking in the X Games. It's kind of sad because that's when we kind of got a bit kicked out of that extreme action sports cycle you know yeah. mm -hmm. and we were uh, back to the cycling nerds you know <laughs> until palmer came along and made it a bit cooler so yeah true <laughs> so what did mountain biking look like let's hey, one second let's find out after the ad break companionship are you looking to take ownership of your health introducing ag1 a powerful daily nutrition supplement designed by scientists to support your body's needs AG1 is a comprehensive and convenient blend of over 70 high quality ingredients packed with vitamins, minerals and whole food sourced nutrients. With just one scoop each morning mixed with water, AG1 helps to support your brain, heart, energy and immune system. It's a powerfully simple way to start your day right. While we have a degree of individuality, science tells us that the human body is interconnected, which is why AG1 contains over 70 ingredients to support your baseline nutrition. Drink AG1 is the best way to feel reassured that you're supporting your body with a broad range of nutrients it needs. AG1 isn't just another supplement, it's a morning ritual, a timely habit that fits seamlessly into your routine. And it does fit into my oh, routine dude, it does, yeah. because I just do it in the morning before anything. Apparently, you're meant to have it on empty stomach, which I actually quite like. I take it with me in my little AG1 shaker and just go walk the dog. I do it empty stomach every yeah. time, actually, because yeah. it, it said on the instructions and I did what was on the instructions. Like, that's you know what I mean? the sort of people we are. Davey, what are the benefits? Well, Ollie, they speak for themselves. From sustained energy throughout the day to immune support and stress management, AG1 has you covered. Plus, AG1 is NSF certified for sport, ensuring the highest quality ingredients and manufacturing standards. Ready to take the next step in your wellness journey? Visit drinkag1.com slash ride companion today for a special offer. We are going to give you free one year supply of vitamin D3 and five free AG1 travel packs with your next purchase. So that's drinkag1.com forward slash the ride companion. That's it? right, mate. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Drinkag1.com forward slash ride companion. Take ownership of your health with AG1. Check it out now. Check it out now. Okay. <laughs> nice ad break that was. That was a nice mate, ad break. I always, best. when we do ad breaks, I forget what the question was that I asked before. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I remember this one. So when you're talking about like X Games... And you're talking about what they kind of decided to depict mountain biking at, as. What actually was it from your experience? Like, what did mountain biking look like then compared to now? Well, back then it was still kind of cross country was the big the big thing. And downhill started to come. We had some cool races, especially the mammoth stuff. And 
National Series, we had those Reebok Eliminators, we had we had Downhill Mania, where four guys raced downhill together, you know, kind of uh, a yeah. four cross downhill format. And we had cool stuff happening and downhill started to get legs and we had a dual slalom scene. But obviously uh, very hard to film a downhill, especially, you know, back then, like and and slaloms. So they said let's do a slalom and let's do a giant slalom, which giant slaloms didn't really exist, but it was kind of the longer kind of version of it. Mm. And and so that was easy to film. And then they had a trials competition. That was kind of cool. And they did a really good job, like, televising it and broadcasting it. And What did your garage look like? What bikes w- did you have? If you if you were a mountain biker, what would your garage look like? In, in 94, five. Yeah, like your garage in 95. I had a bunch of... Um, I had, or not a bunch really, I had usually one bike at a time, like, but a, a 20 inch trials bike and, mm-hmm. G, you know, GT would sell them and, and I would still ride 20 inch and I would also ride 26 and that was a SAS car. And that really was one of the things, once I started doing my trials tricks on a regular mountain bike, like it's, they call it a stock bike, like, a, and the SAS car was that bike, I mean, then that changed everything and people could relate to what we did. You know, before they go like, oh, that looks like... You know, it was unrelatable. It was a specialty bike with a skid blade yeah. and a triple crown yeah. fork, and and people didn't really know what to do with us. Or, but then you did it on the same mountain bike that they own, and they knew how hard it was to bunny hop up a curb and you ride up the side of a car. And they, you know, like they, it, it changed. It changed kind of the way you you were perceived by the people. But then, I would. Right then, full suspension bikes had started to come. So then I had also a full suspension bike, probably an RTS at those days, yeah. or maybe the first LTS right around 95 mm. or so. And um, so those were, would be my three bikes okay. I would have. And yeah, and I would, in my trial shows, I would do ride both bikes. I would switch over. I'm sometimes so jealous when I watch the, the drop and roll tour on those because yeah. those are always like three or four guys riding. I would do the shows all by myself. It was so, <laughs> I was so exhausted and tired. I should have been like smarter and have a, have a show team. You know, sometimes <laughs> I would comp- go do shows with skateboarders and, and, and BMXers together. But as a trials guy, I was always the, the only guy. So usually, so. Who but else yeah. was on the scene at the same time? What other trials riders were doing similar stuff to mm. you? Well, there was Libor Karas. He was okay. on the Volvo Cannondale team and he came from Czech Republic. And we, we kind of, I actually invited him originally. He was a top European rider and I brought him over. I remember calling bike brands up for him and go like, you know, Diamondback and a few others. And hey, do you want, um, do you want a guy, do you want to sponsor a guy who can, what I do for GT, he can do for you kind of. And, and, and eventually we became, or people made us these arch rivals, and that was still like the Cold War kind of. He was like Eastern oh, European, yeah. and and the Hans Ray, and and he also had a blonde ponytail, and <laughs> and we would, you know, and we we weren't generally friends, but it got a bit feisty there sometimes. You know, he tried to go after some of my sponsors and stuff, but but he was a big name, and then there was like right then Odd P, but he was in Europe. He he did come a little bit to America, mm. um, in the. After I came, he came also and visited and spent sometimes the summer there or so, the spring, and we trained together. But he was kind of, t- his ties were, his dad owned Monty Bike, so he couldn't switch to an American bike company that for once. And mm. he was still very tied up in the competition scene. And He was pure 20-inch, right? Yeah, at the beginning. And then yeah. eventually, he, he when we started doing in the bike trial championships a 26-inch class, he then started also riding that that class right so monty made a 26 eventually yeah i, I never saw i never saw but, him, yeah but, but, well basically what what we all said you know trials is always was this unwanted stepchild of everything you know motorcycle trials or even mountain biking we were just the sideshow but spectators loved it and it was it was visually nice and for photos and but we said when the mountain bike boom came let's do a mountain bike class but st- let's build the sections like so you can ride them and use the gears and do all right. that and not the hopping around and stuff. Right. And the the Monty guys then realized, oh, shit, if, if we have that this. class, Hans Ray is going to win it and yeah. then he's going to take away from us Spanish and from Monty. So in the last minute, they, they built a, a 26-inch bike that was basically a 20-inch bike with, like, really, it was not a mountain bike. Yeah. You know, the shift lever was somewhere on the frame and the, and the little, 
you know, and they yeah. and then we came to the first competition in Spain. It was all hopping around, and and everybody who was really excited about coming back to trials, more like old school, where you pedal over stuff, and mm. you know, like, and that wasn't there, but. Um, and that kind of killed it. We were all having hopes that it could catch on, like if it's not so hardcore hopping, and for the masses at least, you know, mm. but people can relate to it and maybe think, oh yeah, I can ride over this table maybe, but I definitely cannot ride up over that counter, you know, for example. But, but so, so this is kind of how it went down. And at the beginning I, I competed in then 26 inch. That was, gosh, I've, I lose track, but that was probably in the, in the early mid nineties, right, and then I think I got out of of out of the competition scenes around eighty ninety six ninety seven. I stopped competing and okay. and started my Hans Ray adventure team, and that was when I kind okay. of left the G team GT, the racing team, and started my own thing where I do these adventure travel expeditions and go to all these remote places and film films and and kind of and at th at that point there was a lot of places where no mountain bike has been you know nowadays try to find a spot on the map where a mountain bike hasn't been it's pretty hard killian's yeah. been everywhere i feel like yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. just taking them off yeah totally yeah <laughs> so do you, would you say um being in laguna helped that sort of like adventure like when did you in, fall in love with like the hills and riding out in the hills and what you do now as, well, as as soon as I came to America, that's when the first time I actually rode a mountain bike right. because I was introduced to the Laguna Rats, which is this one of the oldest mountain bike clubs, and they were known. They're really known as the original free riders, you know, before the word free ride was coined, okay. because once mountain biking got started, I mean, you could you could argue that the original clunkers, you know, were the original free riders. You know, they would go downhill and, mm -hmm. and have fun and ride on the bikes. But then it became racing and all these guys from road racing came in and then the cross country thing got big. Right. And then people started wearing Lycra and people started to take it very serious, training, stopwatches, you know, like, and and the rats kind of kept that spirit, you know, and they would they would ride steeper than anybody at the time, you know, like, you know, like f for those standards, they were really known for riding stuff that nobody would ride down and, Still, some of the trails we rode, like the Rats rode 40 years ago, are still like the top nice. downhills in the world come to Laguna and ride Talonics and PGs. And they rode those those trails like 40 years ago. Wow. And yes, Can't maybe they had... The breaks, like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe they had a bit more dirt on them, the trails, but they were as steep as now. <laughs> wow. I mean, there's some gnarly trails. I, if, if I'm honest, I came in the first time I came to Laguna I completely didn't think it was going to be like that I thought Laguna was like like really chill like really nice flowy trails and we went down what's the steep one with all the catch berms really steep yeah the peaches that's the one yeah I went down that that was the first trail I rode in Laguna I was like yeah, Jesus that's like an, a cross of honor if you if you can say you've ridden or cleaned that trail, and oh, that, yeah. it was back then so like this. <laughs> we, we we counted our dabs down it. Oh, I, I had one dab, or, or I cleaned everything, and and it was like I you know so the rats would like the steep stuff. They would wear t-shirts. They maybe still had a lycra short on, or you know, or baggy surf yeah. short, but they would drink beer and bushwhack, and you know, like and and just like be these these outlaws a little bit you know and who and started it who what's the history of it there was a bunch of guys who got together and they started riding on a wednesday night and then they in 83 they made it this club and and it's kind of this underground bike club like i said it's more like a fraternity because i mean if you would come now to america you you could come on the wednesday night rides you know and ride with us but to become a member Ooh. you eventually has to have to be voted in by everybody and if one person votes against you you're not in or you you know they make it hard you know eventually yeah. if you have the right character and you come yeah, regularly yeah. and you cook and and be be our slave for a few for a few <laughs> months then we eventually vote you in and they become a member but um so that's that's kind of how it all started out and so um, what's it look like now I, I can tell you what at the start <laughs> of one looks earlier. like a bunch of old geezers now <laughs> but, but the pace is phenomenal i really? couldn't believe it dude i'd done like a day with Bernie doing intervals and stuff and then doing laps and then we came for a rads ride and I, I up the first climb I was like this is not for me this is too high paced I couldn't believe it I thought it was like <laughs> yeah a nice you say you saying that you you fit you you were a cross country guy once yeah well I I ride a lot of cross country but yeah. I'm not 
can't help for that. It's proper though, eh? No, they are. They they kept me in shape over the years. They made me a real mountain biker in the first place. They kept me in shape, and they and a bunch of the guys. Now we have kind of two groups. We have the E group, the A okay. group, and the E group. And the A group, e you know, is <laughs> some of those guys, and they're like, well, in their sixties, some of them, you know. I mean, not everybody is that old, but we have some guys. A bunch of guys now in their sixties, and 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 who who is it? Who's in this? Who's in the the rads? It's a mixture of from all sorts of life. People come, you know. Okay. They, some of them are in the industry, you know. Some some guys work for Shimano, like Lobel, or you know, like or, you know, like and some guys work were a pro racer at one point or not, but they are teachers and plumbers and stock Sick. stock brokers and and um, yeah, guys from. Yeah, from the surf industry, some guys from 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 different f- sorts of life, and it's it's just a cool bunch of people camaraderie. In. And we had this annual birthday ride, a guy back in the days, where you literally got points for every beer you drank and for another activity you got a point too. Um, on this pretty short ride, and 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 this ride was also known for every year there would be one new steeper than steep trail would get introduced. <laughs> Actually. And we were on this ride, and we were all pretty lit up and 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 <laughs> and drunk. I mean, literally, like we're talking about a, an hour and a half ride. It was in March, short time, and the winner had eighteen points or so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we at the top of this last downhill, and we run into John Tomek and Craig Herbold. I mean, they were the top names in mountain biking back then, and in my opinion, Tomek is the greatest of all time, and. And Herbold was the first downhill world champion, and they sh- and Herbold already knew us kind of and knew some of us, and he was like to Johnny T, "Come on, let's do with them the last downhill." <laughs> they were so blown away. Like I, I remember at the bottom, <laughs> like Tom Mac was sitting in the fire pit and go like, "That's a new dimension of steep," <laughs> and we were all like, "Ching ching, yeah!" <laughs> Tom Mac just said that. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's who drunk, yeah, running down the steepest. Yeah. And then the o- we have that oldest standing downhill race in the world, the, the Leaping Lizard, and it's oh, been wow. going on for 40 years. This year will be the 40th uh, edition of oh. the Leap. It's the longest standing downhill race. And in the old days, in those days, the, we had a lot of top riders show up. Like I remember the world champion at the time, Joe Sloop. He was the Nova world champion downhiller. Or guys like Herbold or Toby Henderson would show up. And that was the pre-suspension days or full suspension days. But they would get smoked by the local riders because they had all this, this tr- local knowledge and way more, way more training runs and stuff. So there was bragging rights. But then like in the mid-90s, guys like Lopes, um, who, who lives in Laguna too, he started riding with the rats. He's not a rat officially, but he rides with us often and he's a friend with, with everybody. And, but he started like also smoking everybody in the, in the downhill race. And then, you know, obviously full suspension bikes there was better bikes around than yeah. the bikes we would ride on a wednesday night ride you know like a trail bike but um um yeah there's a lot of history That's in those rad, i know it's more of like a roadie thing maybe like a cycling club but mountain bike has never looked like that to this me. one's more like it's I like dog town and z boys you know what i mean yeah it, it feels more like that i was i was really hyped to go and you showed the clubhouse I know. I, f- I feel like a dweeb saying oh, you got it, a like clubhouse too, bike dweeb. But like, you know, you open. Oh, there's the door all this memorabilia in oh, there, and, and all this stuff, and pictures, and old f- broken frames from people, and we have the the icon center. Remember that from, yeah, the, from yeah. the that hangs in there from the o- you know Oakley when they yeah. had the big uh, drop on the rampage, rampage like yeah. the icon center, and that there was a face, a wooden face, or so that hangs yeah. in there because Steve Blick, one of the guys um, um, who who kind of left that there. That's L- rad. A lot of mountain bike history is cool. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Like yeah. a club with you, fr- like with friends, and like you said, meeting other people at a different dis- like different walks of life. Because I don't know about. I mean, my friends are pretty much all in the bike industry, so it's rare that I'll really go out and ride with other people that aren't. Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really lovely. I like well, that. Well, that you know that. There's so much history in Laguna, and just in this canyon, there's a, a canyon that goes into Laguna Beach. Yeah. And like, if you would have asked me six months ago, is like, does anybody in Laguna from the city or the tourism board even know we, we guys? And I would have said no. They never really done anything for mountain biking. But Laguna is is known around the world for mountain biking. People come there for training and holidays and riding mm. and 
and and the city of La- visit Laguna, they did a podcast or a, yeah, podcast too, but they did a little mini series, Radical Origins. It's it's on YouTube, okay. and it's about all these cultures that started in Laguna. Yeah, because it started out with the hippie culture and the whole LSD movement and all that was in Laguna Beach. Timothy Larry lived in the same. He invented really? LSD. He yeah, lived yeah, in yeah. the same in the same house where we had our original rats fire pit, you wow. know, but at a different time he lived there. Yeah. But um, but then there's the Brook Street Surf Contest, which is also like a 40 plus year old surf contest, one of the oldest in the world. Laguna is also home to skimboarding. It's really one of the capitals around the world. So they did little mini series about that. And they did one on mountain biking and about the rats. And they captured really well the spirit and, and they really got into it. And they started to appreciate this whole mountain biking scene because usually Laguna is all about art and stuff. Yeah. And it came to the point where I'm actually now sponsored by Visit Laguna. You know, oh, usually wow. like a spokesperson all over the world for destinations. And they, you know, we're working now together. And I'm super excited because it is such a cool destination and there's so much potential there. And and it's it's fun to to actually do that in my in my home in yeah. my backyard. That's insane. Yeah, that's amazing. How did you how did you end up living in America? Like, did you get a visa? How have you done that? Um, uh, try to say something <laughs> smart as but <laughs> 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 no, because you don't have American parents. No, no, I just. So how did you? The first girl I met, I married and got my papers straight. No, ah, okay. No, no. <laughs> I didn't. I, didn't. I she, she actually got me a work visa and yeah. we worked on that hard. It wasn't easy. And especially trying to explain in 87 to explain to an immigration officer that there's a guy hopping over rocks on a bike <laughs> is a job. Yeah. You know, like extreme sports. All that didn't exist, you know, yeah, yeah. and they had to. We had to kind of give some proof of little newspaper clippings and stuff, and you had to also prove that you're not taking away a job from an American, American could do, yeah, yeah. and all that. And we ended up getting the the work visa, and then we got it. I got it renewed um, over the years, you know. You know, it was it was never straightforward, mm. and eventually, um, I did get married, and and I got a green card. Right. And then eventually, years later, residency. I, I got actually citizenship, yeah. Right, oh wow, so, interesting. Yeah. So it's a hard place to get into, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I hear it's not uncommon that people get a visa now for sports and stuff, you know, like yeah. a lot of these Red Bull athletes and stuff you hear, they, you know, I mean, but they have like, now they're specialists and legal teams and it's, it's a lot different now, you know, but mm. but it's probably still not straightforward, you know, it can be complicated, so... Yeah. I've got to say, I've never tried. I don't know anything about it. Visas always just seem, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> Honestly. That's great. I don't even understand it. So it's so you can pay tax in that country. Well, to get a work, to even to work officially, you get a social security number if you can work. Like there was student visas. And with that, you, you're not allowed to work, but you can, you can stay in America for longer than the, the tourist time. And you can live there and... And you, but you're very limited in what you can do. So there's yeah. different kinds of visas. And there was one for people with a special ability. You know, in the t- at the time it was called the H1 or so. And right. it sounds and like X-Men. And, and but then you, but trial. then yes, you, you pay taxes then too. <laughs> right, and then you okay. have your residency in that country. And um, yeah. Um, yeah. That's cool that GT were involved in getting you your American visa. Yeah, <laughs> Such it is, a rad. Yeah. Like, who can say that about their sponsor? Yeah, they got me really a visa, cool. man. No, yeah. it was it was it was cool to right when they started their mountain biking program. You know, I was at the right time there, and yeah. they had done a mountain bike GT in '85, but it was kind of a BMX bike on steroids, mm-hmm. and then that didn't quite ca- come across. And then they regrouped in '86 and '87. They hired this guy Bill During, who was later in the industry at a bunch of other companies, but he he really came up with the triple triangle design. And we started Team GT, and that was basically Rishi Graywall, who was a cross-country guy, and myself were right. the first uh, Team GT guys. And then they, we brought in Dave Wanderley and Toby Henderson and and so on. But, I mean, GT obviously has really deep, deep roots in BMX and freestyle. Mm. That's where they came from. How big was the company when you joined? How big? Yeah. Well, they were they were one of the biggest, if not the biggest, BMX company, mm. which doesn't mean that much. And uh, honestly, I don't know what that means. You know, is that fifty thousand bikes? Or no, I, I don't even no, know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But um, I just listened to this podcast from Magoo, who was an industry insider, and he he worked all over the industry, and he actually worked at GT. He hired me in my first contract, and um, 
and listen to him talk about these days was such a nice way of going down memory lane and things were just so different back then and and yeah the mountain biking thing was something new and gt said yeah let's get this trials guy and mm-hmm. then it kind of fit in with doing also shows and and the team grew and eventually we got like guys like tom rogers on the team and um julie Fotado and we had this guy gerhard Sadrobilek, and he was the first ever red bull athlete Right? And he came from Austria. He came from road racing, and he was a cross country guy. And he came on our team, and he had a little patch on his on his jersey. Or, or and I remember the following year, we and nobody really knew what Red Bull was. But th- the following year, we got a sponsorship from Power Aid as a team. That's Coca Cola owned uh, drink. Yeah. And I remember our team manager telling the Power Aid guy. You know, we have this Austrian guy and he has that little local Austrian company sponsor on his helmet. Is that a problem? I said, no, nah, we don't care about Red Bull. <laughs> 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 That's insane to think. Yeah. It's insane to think they're not the first, isn't it? You know, yeah, in a yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah, like, I know they're not, but like, yeah. it's weird when you think about it. Yeah, they used to pay him. I think part of his payment was he was collecting these Scotland Highland cattle. <laughs> you know, he was a kind of a farmer and they would they would give him one one a year or so. <laughs> what, a cow? Or so. Yeah. Yeah, Red Bull. <laughs> they pay him in bold. <laughs> That's unreal, yeah. Have you ever done anything with an energy drink? No, I haven't. That's interesting, huh? It's one of my regrets, you know, um, that I didn't. And at the time, partly it was uh, because... Um, they have way too much sugar. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, p- partly it was... Um, I was with Swatch, and Swatch was always on my helmet. Right. And then Red Bull wanted the helmet too, and, and or... Exclusive. At the time, it was just not really po- possible. I, I once did almost a deal with, with, with Red Bull in the late 90s or so, before it really started in America. Mm. And I met the guy, and, he, and I was like, well, I can't do the helmet. But he said, oh, we don't care about the helmet. As long as you have a, our water bottle and you drink and stuff, and your adventures would be perfect. And yes, mm. deal, let's make a deal, handshake. Three days later, that, that guy left and started working for FIFA, the football association. And, and then the f- that didn't happen. And then a few years later, when, when they first started in America, this guy, I think his name was Sean, came to me and said, hey, we want to sponsor you, but... You know, we first of all, the money wasn't that great, what he offered me, and I still had Swatch on my helmet, and I was like, I can't do my helmet, but there's this new sport right now, or this new discipline, it's called free ride, mm. and all those kids don't have a helmet sponsor or anything, you know, I'm sure they would they would run your stuff, and and I guess they went down that road, you know, wow. eventually, and I'm not taking credit for it, but I remember having this conversation before it happened, and shortly after, I think they, they did start sponsoring guys like maybe Aaron Chase was one of the early yeah, ones, yeah, and yeah. Kyle, and, and, and stuff, so... I got, mega interesting, this is it? probably a stupid question, but I've got to ask it. You know, now it's so easy to do deals through email and stuff like that. How did those deals come around back then? How would you... How Have you ever heard about a fax machine? Is that and really, a typewriter? Yeah, like how would those brands get in touch with you? How do you negotiate that? Especially when you're traveling so much. How do you piece all these things Homing together? Pigeon. No, you would meet <laughs> it's people. A pigeon. Yeah. It's got a red Sorry. bull helmet yeah. on. Yeah, <laughs> Smoke signals. <laughs> <laughs> no, you would meet people. It, it's still kind of the same. You meet people at events. You'd yeah. be at a trade show or a big world okay. championship. Or, I knew it was a stupid or question, they would call you up curious. for and, and you were in the middle of it, weren't the, you? You were in the middle yeah, the man. of these people yeah. and all of this stuff. Yeah, but then you would, the, the, the communication, there was no cell phones. You know, that's one of the other things from the early days. There were so many cool moments in my career that really only live in my head. Yeah. Because I, not, not everybody had a cell phone. Yeah. There was a while, I have a bunch of Polaroid photos from a really cool area because Polaroid sponsored this MTV tour we were on. And we had all these Polaroids and that's even though they're fading and stuff. But, you know, sometimes you wish you, you know, you, you had more of these, of these moments captured. But it's, at the same time, it was really pure and nice and you yeah. could really live the moments. And, and, but yeah, the, the communication, I remember dealing with a lot of European sponsors. So the fax machine would run at, and at three o'clock in the morning. Okay. And then they would get a signal that, <laughs> that, the facts didn't go through, so then they tried to resend it again 10 minutes later and 10 minutes later again until I had to unplug everything so I could get some <laughs> sleep. <laughs> but, but <laughs> and, and yeah. It made a crazy noise, didn't it? A fax machine. Was it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so annoying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. 
Right, let's crack on. We're going to go to the ad break and then I'm going to ask you some more cool questions. I've got some really good ones. Have you? I've been holding on to them, yeah. Oh, let's do this ad break then. Yeah, let's do an ad break. All right. All right, Ollie. Hey, what's up, dude? You are back biking, I right? Am. And what I is am. it you love about biking? Oh, I've missed so much. Yeah. It's the corners, it's the compressions, scrubs, jumps. Honestly, generally, it's just shredding. Shredding, is it? Yeah. Well, lacquer are shredding the rules <laughs> of insurance, and it's a great segue. He's okay? done it again. Lacquer uses people-powered insurance subscription to make insurance fair, not fixed. Each month's claims are spread amongst a collective of cyclists like you, so your monthly bill varies up to a guaranteed cap. Oh, that is that is true. Yeah. You, can we go through what it means to be backed by lacquer? Because I think Let's. it's important. Let's do it. Let's do, Let's it. do it. Basically, lacquer is insurance flipped. We won't charge you a fixed sum. Instead, we calculate your monthly contributions up to a capped maximum amount based on the collective's claims. Okay, they call it the 80-20 rule. What's 80% that? of your money goes straight back into the collective fixing, replacing, helping, whatever. And the other 20% keeps our wheels spinning. Lacquer's wheels, not ours wheels. That's clever ours though because spinning. it's bike related and because of, yeah, it's a great it bike. makes a lot of sense. It does. It's, it's kind of a pack mentality with lacquer that I love. I love it. Being part of lacquer means committing to looking after yourself and your stuff for the sake of the group. Think team first. Think team you know what I mean? First, yeah. Just like the companionship, lacquer have got your back. Yeah, that's right. When shit hits the fan, yeah. they've got you covered. All right. Claims are handled by experts and usually agreed within a day with no depreciation or excess. Hey, and, and the last point, you're never tied down. Never I love that down. about lacquer. You're never tied down. You, you can leave when, anytime you want. Yep. Anytime you want. Just like this ad, I might leave right now. But no. Don't. You, no. We've we'll got... Get into the best bit. Absolutely. And we've got, we've got unique offers for the companionship. We have, mate. We have. Yeah. Also, worth mentioning, mm. you can insure your bike for travel. Nice. At the races. You like can insure well. kit. So let's say you buy a new okay. helmet, you go Even out, helmet. smash it. Insane. They got you covered, mate. Yeah. All right. If you would like to take advantage of a 30-day free insurance offer, <sighs> Cavalier for 30 days, aren't you? You'd be riding through the hood, wouldn't you? <laughs> Head to lacquer.co and enter the code RIDECOMPANION30. What is it? I, th I think you just said Ride Companion 30, but is that caps? It is all in caps. Ride Companion 30. At lacquer.co, and that's going to give you 30, day, 30 days free insurance on us. Nice. we got to cover it. Have we? Yeah. Please do it. But <laughs> Please do it. Okay, good. Thanks, Lacquer. <laughs> Thanks, Lacquer. And we're back. Great ad again. It, dude? Just keep it, knocking dude? the ads out of the park. Right, so you <laughs> basically use your bicycle to adventure everywhere around the world. I feel like one that stands out in my head is Kilimanjaro. And I thought maybe you could talk about not only the trip itself, but how you came up with it and what you were thinking at the time. Well, Kilimanjaro is one of those mountains that everybody has heard of. You know, there's so many mountains where rock climbers or expeditions go on that you never heard of. You don't even know what country they're in. But you, you say Kili or Everest or there's very few, Matterhorn, you know, those are known. And so I was, I wanted to do it for a long time, but you, you, they didn't have, they didn't allow bikers on Kilimanjaro forever. And they treated it like a national park and a lot of national parks around the world had adopted the American national park rules with no biking. Mm. So the bike, the mountain was off limits, even though a, c a couple guys had done it before that, that rule came out and a few guys and, and then a few charity uh, causes got permission to go up there and do it with bikes. But when they finally opened it up in 2016 to give permissions, for bikers to go up a certain route, they had to have a guide with them. And I think that's still intact, you know, but, you know, then we were like, well, put it this way, I went there a few years before, 2016 was the one with Danny where we actually did it. And and I, I want to say like five or six years before, I went there and I, I still couldn't get up, I tried. And, they, and then I did a circumnavigation of three days. We rode around the foothills and right. really cool. The landscape changes all the time. And I did that and combined it with the Wheels for Life, my charity a project there in Africa. And then this guy, Gerhard Zerner from Germany, he's a, a free rider, a, a professional rider, guide stuff. And he, um, he said, hey, do you want to do... 
Killy with me, and I was like, first I was like, hmm, I don't know. And then I was like, yeah, no, it would be cool. And then I asked Danny, Danny, you want to come along? It'll, it'll be fun, you know? And Danny was like, okay, let's do it, you know? <laughs> so so we got this together, and we got a film crew together from Freeride Entertainment. They filmed it all and captured it. Otherwise, nobody would believe us now. <laughs> 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 and no, but so we went out and we did it, and, and then we decided, okay, we, but we got to acclimate, right? Do something, you know? And some of the guys, they slept in oxygen tanks tense like right. the photographer and Gerhard before and they got ready and they trained and you know and I was you know I was 50 at the time for me it was like if I don't do it now I don't think I'm ever gonna do it because you know like I you know like getting on here you know how how high are we talking with uh Killy how high 6,000 meters almost 6, meters just right. under 6,000 I mean, that meters that's high, high. I've ever been yeah and Goodness. yeah so so we wanted to kind of acclimate and then this this guy who arranged everything had everything acclimated except there was like another national park and and we found out last minute oh you're not allowed to to it's going to be just on foot he said like, we're going to hike around for three or four days you know <laughs> we want to ride our bikes so let's go and do mount kenya the second highest mountain which is like a couple two three hour drive away mm. you know and i had done mount kenya before and that was one of the coolest trips ever oh, wow. and one of the hardest and in 2004 richie and i did it nice and we did a we called it a first descent but since then i got called out some guy did it like 20 years before on a oh, really? show or so <laughs> and he's like you know like he actually like called me out and i was like wow then let's see the photos he said, well i need to go to the attic at my mom's house and <laughs> he did send me some photos on on the summit by oh, himself man. like it was a selfie but with the old summit cross it was a special cross and I was like, dude, you got it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, Richie and I did it like, and it, it was six days to get up or so, and it was hard. And then six days, so, yeah. So, so you're intense. Yeah. Yes. So, you're so so we went back. So we decided let's go to, let's do Kenya again. I forgot how hard it was. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as a warm up, you know, and we only had four or five days, okay. so we were pushing it for time. And our permit was for a certain day to start at Kili, so we had to be at Kili, and that's when we did. You know, we basically can claim we were the first to do Kenya and Kili, the, the two highest mountains in Africa, back to back. And then if that's how it all unfolded. But Danny Amazing. didn't make one of them. Then he made it to the top of Kili. Yeah. He did, but not the first one. Yeah. I can't quite remember which one. Yeah, no, the he, got, um, he got altitude sick, and that happens. You know, yeah, you never yeah. know. It can be anybody. And, and in all fairness, I, I took. I took Diamox pills. They help you prevent alcohol uh, altitude sickness. You know, it's, okay. it's not guaranteed, but it helps you adjust your body, you know, and, and to give more oxygen to your body if you take it. And some of the guys wanted to do the pure way. And I'm like, thought that. I'm bloody 50, you know. Yeah. Like I, I'm, 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 I'm happy if I don't get a heart attack like trying to do this mountain. So I went up um, Cotopaxi and they gave me like um, uh, coca leaves. Yeah. Like I don't know what it does. What it, what is it, it? It it it. They say it helps, but it's one something like you cannot really prove. Like mm, like right. them saying take vitamin C. You know, yeah. like it's like what does it really do? I'm sure it helps, and and the, co the it gives you this little highness, or it, I don't know exactly what the cocoa leaves do, but the, no. I've I've taken them before in 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 South America, but I also got sick in Ecuador once. Um, Have you? Um, actually, and I was... Altitude again. Yeah, we did five volcanoes in five days, and I got... S and I had to skip Cotopaxi because that day I had to recover and let the other guys do it without me. What is it about these, like, big peaks that you're drawn to, then? Is it... It was just a challenge, something that hadn't been done, and often, often you know, these... These these peaks or or the, the trails leading to them were even more interesting because they were trekking trails. I mm. used to buy the Lonely Planet travel books or these 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 guides, the best t hiking treks in the world. And I knew if people can hike them, I can bike them. You know, as long as there's not a steel cable involved yeah. where you have to hold on, that's when it gets like too steep for bikes usually. But um, other than that, you know, I can, with my trial skills at least, so that's what I always targeted, like the old Inca trail in Machu Picchu or the the Annapurna circuit trail or the, you know, like, or climb certain volcanoes like in, you know, in, in Ecuador or Chile or, or 
Philippines or wherever mm. they were. What did the early um, the early adventures look like? Because now I guess you can come away with it probably with more like content deliverables, you know, with a GoPro and a this right. and a that. But what like the early ones? What did you get from it other than doing it? Did you also come away with like deliverables and content? Yeah, and we made films. We made had films. TV films. Okay. I, they okay. are on my YouTube channel too. Some of them are a bit of grainy quality because nowadays I could probably do a better film on my iPhone than we did with the big beta cameras back then. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes these guys had these big so beta cameras and, and carry them. Oh. Like w when we did the, <laughs> when we did Mount Kenya with Richie in 2004, the HD thing just started to happen. Mm -hmm. But the HD cameras were like big, like a beta cam. And those two, and we said, okay, this, this mountain is so technical. Usually the camera guys are also on bikes. We said, this mountain is so technical, it, I don't think it makes sense for you guys to, to, to bring your bikes because you have to carry that big camera too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to be ready and, and all that. And, and so they walked the whole thing with, with the big camera <laughs> and it was shot. And then, um, yeah, and then we always had a photographer and we would we would kill it with these trips because they would be all over the magazines. Yeah. It's like, I remember like a, a story like going to Machu Picchu. Yeah, we that one we filmed very unprofessionally with one of those little video cameras from the days. And just like, it was really about the photos, but the photos would end up in 30 magazines, you know? And this, the cool thing about these adventure trips, and that's still true to the ones I do today, they they have quite a shelf life. You know, mm. most races are forgotten two weeks later. Yeah. And these adventures, you you know, they still forever. play on TV like five years later on the replay or they, you know, the story can still be, you might be able to say, oh yeah, look at the color of the fork, you know, that must have been five years ago. But but other than that, it's like, you yeah. know, it's it's still the same. The adventure spirit is still there and the experience. And, and that drove me to do these things just to have this, challenge and to do something that ha hasn't been done before and i always knew that it was kind of up my alley with these technical trails mm. so what have you got a trip that went like horrendously wrong <laughs> no luckily not <laughs> not horrendously wrong but we i did a i tried to do a mount mayon volcano with brian lopes um about i don't know 18 years ago or 15 years ago and that's the deadliest volcano in the world, and it's a super perfectly cone-shaped volcano. But when we got to this first night camp, it started to really ramp up, and it was jungle too. And it got so steep that... And then there was... The higher camp had been destroyed by a flood or something. Right. So we, we would have to go all the way to the summit. It was so steep that we, we hiked up on foot like over an hour, and we were like none of that is rideable on the way down you know it was that steep yeah yeah like so we decided you know mission you know unrideable you know we d we actually turned around and hey, really and didn't do it so and then other than that there was there was there was some mishaps and stuff but that's when you have to come to my talk to and ah, listen to them he's a professional yeah. Yeah. is there anywhere you haven't that you want to go though that you've not ticked off um is there a location that's like oh that's next I don't know. I, I, you know, I've been cho I'm enjoying the, the whole evolution of mountain biking. You know, there's different goals. You know, for a while it was all these remote places in the world. Yeah. And then I was like, man, I've been everywhere and everybody else has now been there too. And then I started doing these urban adventures and I picked these really big cities that have really incredible nature around them and in them. And you okay. would never believe like the mountain biking you find like right in and around Mexico City or Hong Kong or San Francisco or, you know, some mountains have like, it goes up to like three, four thousand meters right next to the town and world class trails. And so that's been kind of cool. But then I've been really enjoying hitting all these new bike destinations that pop cool. up all over the world, you know, like, like Blue Derby in Tasmania or or in Switzerland, you mm. know, stuff in Descentis at Rune or in, but like really the, the, the classic ones where there's this bike culture, like Bentonville is like this place. We talked about it earlier before the yeah, thing go, yeah. where they just built these incredible trail networks and it's like Disneyland for bikers. And there's so many places now popping up everywhere. And yeah. it's, I think it's a really good time to be a mountain biker and to, to, you know, like, so I, I feel like I don't have like any, first descents really on my okay. radar right now i'm just like what about ascents on e-bikes because surely that's opened up like e-bikes is mm. a, a new chapter for you isn't it 
yeah, I've been e-biking a lot. I still ride both bikes, but I, I have to admit, I'm, I enjoy the e-bike more. And it's fun. And it opened up exactly what you said. You know, the technical riding, this old school trials riding when you ride over stuff without hopping necessarily too much or a little hopping. But, yeah. but um, I can ride up hills in Laguna. It's so steep where we usually hike and bike. And now I can maybe not, some of them are still not cleanable on an e-bike either, but you can ride the majority of it. And if you have to push for a little bit or carry even your bike for a little bit, that's fine. But it's those challenges that I really embrace. And and in the back of my head, I, I was thinking about Kili on an e-bike. Yeah. I don't know if they would allow it. And I don't know how you would do it with the battery management because you would literally have to have a port or carry extra batteries that are pre-charged or bring mm. a generator, you know, <laughs> and stuff, which, which is possible. But I don't know. It's It's... I don't know if I want to go over 5,000 meters anymore. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's hard It's hard stuff, even on an e-bike, I think. And and I, what would you do on an e-bike on Kili? Would you try to knock it out in one day? So before you get altitude sick, you already go down? Mm. Or, and then you have to be like super fit, like, yeah. like, like, and, or if you take your time, like on a regular bike, then, yeah. So it but comes with its own problems, Somebody's got to do it? it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thought because it's definitely opened up a lot of different things, hasn't it? Travel is difficult, though, at this stage. Oh, with the e-bike battery. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and true. the thing on Kili is you could ride everything except the last stage, and the last stage would be would be hard to carry a heavy e-bike. And it, it was brutal, I want to say, six or seven hour stage yeah. on, a, on an analog bike where you had to basically walk or carry the whole way because not only it's the, 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 it's steep and loose ground, but the, the air is so thin, you, you, you ride like for 10 meters and you're yeah, completely yeah. like gassed, you know. So, so, an, so on an e-bike, you would probably have to, and that particular route was extremely steep. I think there might be some easier hiking routes where it might be more e-bikeable, but they probably wouldn't allow you there. Mm. yeah it's so true the altitude i went to that annapurna loop and with warner actually <laughs> and i got got there and i was like well, i don't think i feel anything altitude wise because I, I always i'm always skeptical about these things when people oh, are moaning yeah. i'm always a bit like oh, i don't know if i feel it and then i went for a ride a cross-country ride with the parkings and i was like mate i can't i literally <laughs> can't do this like we've we've been riding 10 minutes oh really just I gas. absolutely gassed just just working trying to just go up this fire road yeah I was, I was probably super fit at the time as well and i was like i couldn't believe wow. it actually so the thought of being higher than that um where we were john johnson we were we were staying at. yeah i've been there yeah yeah funny place isn't it <laughs> yeah i mean it's just rock and nothingness <laughs> and sheds it's oh really unbelievable yeah, yeah. but that you, where you're at is like still probably two thousand more. Yeah, I mean, if the Annapurna circuit, the highest point is probably under five thousand, right, or around five. Yeah, and, and Kili is six thousand. So yeah, um, a thousand more. That's the high. That's like Ben Nevis more. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's a lot more, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and it gets it gets hard up there at this altitude. So, um, but yeah, somebody will do it on an e-bike one day. How long have you been e-biking for? Because been involved with GT? Do you get early access to these things? I was actually an early, early advocate when people were laughing yeah. about it. I, I, and there's a particular pro rider who had a really big e-bike career after his analog career was over. But I remember like the year before he started e-biking, he was making fun of me. Oh, you're getting <laughs> old, you're getting gray hair, uh, e-bikes, you know, how lame. And then and then like he had a whole like second, <laughs> you know, like and it's the big Mr. E-bike. And there was... I actually did my very first e-bike ride back in 97. Oh, <laughs> what? No way. Yeah, together with President George Bush. At the time. What? What? <laughs> yeah. Wait. Dude. <laughs> Talk us through this. At right. the time, GT was just gone public, and they, they had acquired always other companies, like BMX companies usually or stuff, and they had invested into an e-bike company that was way ahead of its time. It was called Charger. Not nothing to do with the English charge brand, but I think they were called Charge a huge battery, and there was this sto this event, and and Bush was there speaking, and everybody was like, "Is there's a photo op with the press if you want to do one?" And at the time, I wasn't a big Bush fan, 
And I was like, I do it if I can do it with my bike. They said, well, then you have to wait to the very end and we can come in. And I did actually back wheel hops and he shook my front wheel <laughs> instead of my head. What did he do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he was super cool. But TT brought that that charger bike in there. I was and and he test rode it in this hotel conference room and he did he did some laps and I followed him riding a wheelie and and that and I remember him like, Oh, this is great. I need one for Barbara, his his wife. And then I and then and then he was like, oh, no, I need two, actually. I want one, too. And then he was like, no, wait, I need, like, I need actually four. I need, like, two more for the Secret Service guys so they can keep up with us. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, that was my first, like, rubbing elbows with e-bikes. And then... And, and then the president. And then la later... <laughs> yeah, that was a funny little encounter. But la later, I, I was into it, like, when, when it really started in Europe and, and like, years before. And G at the time, GT didn't have an e-bike. Right. So I, I, it was about 2008 or so, or nine, I converted one of my GT force bikes and I put a rear hub motor in there and, a, add, and added a battery, you know, like those bionic systems they had back then. Yeah. yeah. And I just used it kind of to go to the post office kind of a bike, you know, okay. but rode a little bit off road with it, but that was early on. And then, and then I had to wait, you know, when the boom then really kicked off, I, GT didn't have a bike initially, you know, and then ever since they have one and now. Now I've been like really into it. Been working with Shimano really closely. I'm one of their ambassadors, and and I think it's awesome. These bikes, you know, have have opened up a whole new world. And yeah. for me, they came at the right time. I think <laughs> <laughs> yeah, conversations absolutely. for sure change, and I think even between the people that I speak with, it's definitely changed so much now. Where before you kind of get not ridiculed, but you'd be like, oh, you're e you know. Yeah, I had, I had an e-bike when I first like started riding for Focus, and it was like. It was it was in the contract. It was like you don't have to promote this. It, they were really set. They were so cool about it. They were like they didn't want to make yeah. me feel like I had to promote something I didn't believe in. And I and I went for rides on it, and I was like, it was already an amazing bike. It was already up to sort of modern standards. It was a Shimano motor. It was it was a good bike, but I was just on my own, and mm. I didn't like, I didn't get it as much. Yeah. And then the moment um, a friend got one, then it was like. Ah, you know, it was yeah. like instant. It yeah, like mix mix rides don't work out so well. You have nah. to be it's, you have to be on the same bikes even. You know, people with half it, unless they they're so much fitter than yeah. You know, but then you have to be super fit to hang. But um, yeah, you have to you need a you need a mate to ride with. And Definitely, yeah, yeah, that's you've seen like the media landscape change so much throughout your career. What do you see now for mountain biking, like? What is it you do? You like all the stuff on the phone? Do you like the YouTube, the vlog stuff? Like, what? What's your feeling on all of this? <laughs> well, it, it sure has changed, you know, from back in the days. I mean, there used to be like five big photographers in the world for mountain biking who would shoot the majority of the photos. Yeah. And nowadays, everybody with an iPhone has become a photographer, and and it's it's a bit overwhelming sometimes, you know, back. Back in the days, like I have a hot love hate relationship, you know, because it's it's a very cool tool and you can do so many cool things with it and and it's great, but it's hard to keep your finger on the pulse these days. There's so yeah. much going on and even even the biggest names do stuff that goes like it's forgotten like a day or two later, you know? Yeah. And it's it's so many people and uh, and doing it and yeah, it's just it's just changed, and you just have to kind of go with it. And you know, everything has has a good side to it too. And I'm not the biggest fan of filming on myself. That's why I, I I didn't jump on the whole GoPro thing either. Even though I had an opportunity early on, and I was like, kind of, I was so spoiled being photographed by you know, like I was like, I don't want to you know film myself. I let I let some cameraman <laughs> yeah. do that and stuff. And and and. And nowadays you have to do it and and yeah, it's just like it's just like with the sponsoring cake. You know, like there was a time when if you wanted to be a professional mountain biker, you had to be a racer. And and mainly a cross country or a downhill guy. Mm. There was a few guys who got sponsored because they were like a four cross specialist or a slalom guy. But other than that, there was hardly anybody to make a living outside of racing. And I was I was doing that with my with my trial shows and with my videos and and at the time like I said it was like you had the finger on the pulse you could there was five guys eating off that non-racing pie yeah 
Now there's 5,000 people eating off that pie. Mm. I mean, if you count in all the free riders and the, the, the YouTubers and the influencers and the trials guys and the Podcasts. dirt jumpers and then the, <laughs> you know, and even you have to count the mountain bike guides. There's so many now and they are kind of semi-professional or at least a yeah, lot of them yeah. are sponsored. They get bikes from a brand and that goes all taps into that budget of, you know, mm. so, so there's a lot of people eating off that pie now and, and, yeah, one single move or action is is not as gravid than yeah than it used to be. It's so interesting, man, because you shouldn't actually like it's it's so easy to just go. Let's say someone who's not actually very good at biking is an influencer. It's so easy to knock it, but it's not like like oh, I don't feel like that's a part of that same pie. Do you know what I mean? It's like a it's almost like a separate thing. Like people want to like um, they want something they can relate to. Even if it's not good biking, yeah. So, so then for someone to compare kind of like Semenuk at the very pinnacle to this person who's doing how 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 I learnt to bunny hop, it's like it's really different. Actually, it's no no one should feel threatened by it. No, it, but equally because of this pie, you kind of do, don't you? You kind of yeah. I yeah. guess, I don't know why. And I don't know if it's also threatened. It's also a bit, I think even the marketing people are confused. It's hard yeah. to put the value on anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, what is it worse to get fifth at Rampage? Or what is it worse to go like, have 10 million yeah. views on a on a TikTok thing? Or what is it worse to have a double page in? Yeah, what's 40 million views on German TV now? Yeah. You know, people would be confused by that. It's too complex. Like, yeah. Because it, even magazines, because I, I used to think, well, magazines were easy. That this magazine sells twenty thousand, and I've got a page in it, double page. It's worth this. That's what they'd pay for advertisers, sure. But then you've got to like factor in that the person has to sit down, they have to read through it, and on the page where they're opening you, they have to not take a sip from their coffee, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they could miss it that easy. Yeah, just the same as when they're scrolling through Instagram. Yeah, but not as not it. as easy than on on Instagram. You no, miss stuff true. much quicker, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know how many tweets you miss since we've been sitting here you yeah, know they will true. never come back and yeah and like maybe they're the ones that could change my life you don't it's know it's funny though because we actually kind of had it this morning because you mentioned like a clip that bernie had put up and we're, we follow the same probably people but you'd seen it i hadn't seen it that's really interesting isn't it well you expect that everyone's seen it but they haven't yeah. that's that's that is frustrating with the whole algorithm business yeah. and how it changes constantly and how you know you you work hard i mean the people who have the real Instagram account without buy it stuff, you know it's hard to get another hundred followers. You work for that, you yeah. know? Yeah. And you, you work up to wherever you are, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, you know. And and then Instagram decides, yeah, but we're only gonna show twenty percent of your followers uh do content. Yeah, for the rest you have to Hopefully you pay because it looks like you might be a professional or have some sponsors who would give you money. Mm. Or you know, it's just like this this game they Guessing. play where yeah. you know and you produce everything you do production company director uh, you know in a, in your own way for your own channel and and it's the algorithm thing i yeah I, it is what it is but it's yeah. very frustrating it's interesting to hear we had chris acrig on recently and he loves like you were saying you don't want to go out you don't like going out and filming yourself that's literally his thing. yeah that's what he loves isn't it yeah he's Love, he loves that about it he films everything on his own it's and just he, interesting to think, isn't it? It's like it's similar, but it's like they've just got you guys have got a totally different approach to it. Yeah, yeah. It, but it's sometimes it's so much easier when you have a person like for an angle, like to find a tripod that's high enough, and mm. to you know to do all this and that. And yeah. I mean, I I have the biggest respect like people like Danny and Fabio and, and some of those guys who do like sometimes three, four hundred tries to get the, to oh, get nah. the trick right. You know, like, I don't have the patience anymore. I do it twice, and okay, I did it half ass, but it's good enough. Let's, <laughs> let's post it. Yeah, I have, like, rule of three, I think. I think three is max. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We like that with ads, for sure. Yeah, yeah, three yeah. goes, and it's Third done. one's perfect. Yeah, that yeah. Hey, talking of ads. Ollie, mate, what yeah. is the ads? What are you doing? Well, I didn't think I'd have to stop. It's so quiet. I know you've been riding a lot, and you're really trying to focus on recovery, but yeah. you can't always be recovering can you i can if i sponsor this complex and you got the fix 2.0 and i'm making my legs feel better oh <laughs> man <laughs> yeah. honestly this thing is incredible it's been helping me out loads i've been yeah. riding a lot and this yeah. thing 
I get home and I just use it for recovery. You can use it for before as well, though, right? You can, mate. Yeah, the Compex Fix 2.0 Master helps warm up muscles before a workout. Oh, nice. And relieve, sti- relieve stiffness okay. after a hard session, okay? That's what I, yeah. That's, that's what, what you, I that's use, what you're using it for. It for. Yeah, yeah, I've just yeah. finished a hard session, so. Yeah, it has yeah. five. <laughs> Ollie. Yeah. It's my favorite tool as well, all right? The yeah. Compex Fix 2.0 Massager helps warm up muscles before a workout and relieve stiffness after a hard session. Yeah. Okay, it's got five powerfully, powerful intensity settings. Oh, yeah, it has. That's that's done with this dial here. That's done with the it's dial. really good, yeah. Paired with a high stall force will give the intense pressure needed to help relieve the toughest spots safely and comfortably. Hey, I want to point out that the stall force thing is really important because when you're pushing down yeah. hard, yeah. really getting in those difficult points... Nooks and crannies. It's not stalling and and some of the other ones i'll be honest yeah you not only did stop. i buy them off amazon they got they stalled and then they set my house on fire oh. so you don't want that no mate you don't want that at no. all it also comes with five interchangeable tips yep okay and a rotating arm helps tailor your massage specific to the needs of different muscle groups okay yep. It has a removable and rechargeable batteries, a compact design, and a quiet motor help provide relief anywhere and everywhere, okay? So you can bring your inner pro with a Fix 2.0 massage. That rhymed. Gun. It did rhyme. Just saying that rhyme. It did, yeah, it did yeah. rhyme. But yeah, honestly, dude, real life experiences. I use mine all the time. Post-ride, pre-ride. I just love using the Compex Fix 2.0. Do you know what I found? The other day, I yep. was at my physio. Everything he had was Compex. Oh. I really liked that, mate. Yeah. It's really good. Chosen by professionals. Yeah. And they do loads of other stuff too. So check out Compex.com. All right. You can look through all of the different recovery tools. They've got... Uh, muscle stims. Muscle I've been stims. using the muscle got, stims yeah, on my Yeah, they got the core so belt. Good. They got... Do this uh, ankle protection. You need some of that. Need it. Wrist protection. Maybe need some of that. <sighs> I do now. Yeah. Oh. Loads of I'm stuff. I'm going to get Compex up, dude. Compex up. Hey, do we have anything to offer? To our companionship, because I do like it when we finish ads on an offer. Yeah, we've got to finish on it. It's a big offer too, mate. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So if you head to compex.com, enter the promo code, the ride companion. Okay. What is it? The ride companion. All in caps. Okay, nice. I was about to ask. We're going to knock off a whopping 20% off. 20%? 20% off. Now, that if that's not a deal to get you recovered, ready to ride through spring, then I don't know. Hey, you Can't might- do any better. You might get 20% off, but you're going to be 100% satisfied with the product, let me tell you. Oh, and on that note, that was nice. thank you, Compex. Thanks, Compex. Great ad. Hans, when was the heyday of mountain biking? Oh, brilliant. David, that's a good question. Man. Thanks. Yeah. In your opinion. Whenever you sit on your bike and ride, I guess. <laughs> but, um, that's such a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know. It was a special era in the, in the, in the <laughs> early 90s. I was thinking it today. I, I saw a post from somebody I knew from back in the days from Life's the Beach clothing brand. I was never sponsored by them. I was a No Fear guy, but the same guys who did No Fear. Really, were you? It was such a cool brand, but they had a reunion party last night, and I saw an Instagram, <sighs> and it was so cool, and I was like thinking, there was so many memories popped up, just like looking at that post and some of the people there, and that... What was behind No Fear was incredible at the time. You know, they mm. were really revolutionizing everything, not just, you know, with their products, but really sports marketing. marketing. Way. You know, they yeah. had all the best, biggest athletes in the world on their roster, and most of them didn't get paid, at least initially. Right. You know, and it was like, it was such, such a cool thing to be a part of and stuff. But anyway, and being, you know, there in Southern California and, and having to tap into all these different sports that were all kind of about to get really big and scenes, you know, and they, you got to rub elbow with the music scene a little bit and with, with, with skate and stuff. But then mountain biking, when it really became big, and then it wasn't, it wasn't big when I first got there. Mm. And in 87, I got there. And then in 1990, it kind of started to explode. Okay. We had the first mountain bike UCI World Championships, and it became big. And then the 90s, from 90 to 95, were really the heyday. The sport was, like, booming. We had the big teams. I mean, GT had this huge semi-truck. I mean, we're talking, like, motocross style, you know, nowadays, you know. We had one of those back then. Wow. and And it was just, like... It became mainstream. It, we saw mountain biking on TV commercials more. You saw it in 
in you know people would buy a bike and it was just a cool era and maybe what made it cool it was because it was it was all new yeah and nobody had expectations yeah and and kind of it was just fun to hang out and ride and every weekend there was a a new face you didn't see and he could do a trick or something that you hadn't seen or a new product was introduced and not all of them were always better <laughs> for the better <laughs> <laughs> you know there was a, but there was like a trial and error thing and there was new events and new formats and new styles and and it was just like snowball effect you know and yeah and it was yeah it was it's like a buzz that's quite difficult to recreate huh yeah, I mean, you guys had it here in the UK when I think I remember those the Malvern days, the early Malvern yeah. classic, yeah. you know, the festivals were pretty rowdy and fun and cool. There was really the whole scene there and and you guys always had a big scene in the UK and then the trade shows I remember because I used to go there to do trial shows or so like at Ali Pali or at, at you know the NEC or so and and those days you, you you know they were different you know and and it was kind of cool i think i have really fond memories of those early days in the uk scene you know to mm. and a lot of a lot of these guys are still around you know they work in the industry somewhere or they you know they and it's like it's one of those sports you know like you can easily become a lifer you yeah. know so yeah yeah my early no fear days must have been so fun so you had we on no fear clothing mm-hmm Wow, like I remember the I remember when McGrath first signed the clothing deal for uh, Moto, and just like that is the sickest thing, and it came from board shorts. Is that right? Life's a beach was that no, board they, shorts? Yeah, life's a beach, and then they started no fear, and they did these T-shirts with really pro- pro- provocative quotes. Okay, that, uh, you know, like really, like some of them were almost like vulgar, but some of them were like, uh, <laughs> what was the famous one with the chicken and the. Anyway, like it was all about no, f- you know, big attitude, no fear, yeah. big balls, Eat my big dust balls, and yeah, stuff like that, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember it being. And, like, remember and it was, it was, it was a statement. If you had a no fear shirt on, it was a, a statement, and 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 it was just new. And, but he, they got all these athletes to be part of that little club, like from top baseball players to to car, NASCAR drivers to like McGrath or Ricky Johnson or Glenn Blake, the skier with the Mohawk. And, and I was one of their mountain biking guys. And I think later Mike King was one of them. And then they had a few more over the years. But um, And it was cool. But like, for example, you remember when McGrath came on the scene and and remember when the when the team was sponsored by one eight hundred collect? Yeah, yeah. At the time, as far as I know, McGrath wasn't necessarily paid by No Fear okay. at, initially. Okay, but they got him the one eight hundred collect deal, which kind of helps. And and that's like bills. that was kind of our agent fees. You writing our you know so they did kind of create these partnerships yeah. with they would get another one of their athletes who would like be more like a pro and mm. maybe maybe they give him a Harley Davidson for a bonus at the end of the year or so, like some some basketball player or whatever. But but they would maybe line him up with sp- for a Sprite commercial or so. Yeah. And then that guy could make some money through the Sprite commercial and no fear. And it was kind of, it was it worked like this. Mm. And then initially, then they wanted to get in the surf industry. And they sponsored Sonny Garcia, I think. Right. And, and the rumors had it, they, they threw like a huge amount of money at him. Like three hundred and fifty grand who were shorts or the you know and and they so they tried to buy their way in the into the surf industry and that didn't quite work out and then the surf industry altogether kind of right. started to have a little hiccup but um but I think something also changed them and work out that one guy gets paid all this money then all of a sudden the other guys were like well maybe we should it's time to pay yeah. us too you know Harley is not enough <laughs> so, yeah. so that was part of this thing and and yeah and I was actually for a while I was the, chi- the distributor in Germany for No Fear were you really? yeah for like um, quite a while so wow yeah that's sick dude that's yeah, the very best. cool. yeah what's Never the um, this is you don't have to answer this but I gotta ask you what's the biggest deal you've signed? <laughs> I don't know. It's you know what, I or don't like know. just the, out of industry, even like I was so always underpaid my whole career. <laughs> 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 
that's a clip. No, but, but, but honestly, I've never had those huge money deals. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm still around because they were like, this guy is so fucking good. It's such a good bargain. <laughs> it's such a cheap <laughs> bargain. No, <laughs> no they, they, they take care of me. I, 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 I had a, f yeah, like, Swatch GT, you know, like they were good sponsors, you know. GT's yeah. been my best sponsor and my, yeah. my, my most loyal sponsor and and but there was there was never any stupid money really. Some uh, of the movies must have been way. cool. Some of the T V yeah. stuff with the with the fun fun days doing that stuff. I've always got this picture of it being mental. The money just being completely <laughs> mental when you get on T V, especially back then. Maybe I'm wrong. It no, back then in the nineties, if you did a TV commercial and you were like a did a stunt, like or you were like a you know not an extra, extra would be the guy standing in the background or so. But if you were a stunt double or or, or a character even in it, you know, with residuals you could easily make like anywhere from twenty to fifty grand on a commercial. You right. know, so it's it's pretty good money, especially back then. You know, yeah. if you get them and you you don't get them all the time. And so the residuals are after yeah, you've yeah. got your day rate and then you have residuals yeah. and it just. Basically, that's like every time it gets played, there's a figure. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's okay. a union. You're part of a union. I'm part of the Screen Actors Guild. It's a, it's yep. the, where all the actors are in, and I will get a pension from them one day. I, I worked long enough in the in SAG. it. I heard as a, a lot SAG. of people you know, talking it's, about it's not SAG. much, so you know, but it's it's like it's something, and you organize, and they make sure you do get paid, and they're not gonna sell the show to Russia, and then you don't get royalties or so, you know, mm. of it. And the royalties can often be like pennies, you know, but they do add up and. But I never had those really big deals. I never and I never had a video game like you know, like like some of these yeah. athletes had, or you know, there's a lot of like stuff that that I I haven't had. But I've I've been always happy with what I do, and I I've done doing I've been doing all right for the last like you know like thirty some years. So um, so sick. Yeah, it's life is good. Life is good. I'm not complaining too much. No, even though I do you still love it as a much? bit grumpy in my old days. <laughs> 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 do you still love it like as much? Like, what does biking look like to you now? Uh, it's it's different. It it is it surely is a bit of a job, and sometimes you know the the pressures are there. You also, I'm also have to admit, I I feel my age now too. Okay. I never did. I always thought, oh man, when I turn thirty, I'm gonna pay the price for all those drops to flat you know <laughs> i've been doing you know <laughs> yeah. and and all that other stuff and and i've been surprised how good you know like i've been you know like even in well into my 50s but the last few years you know you have to work harder on it and and it's i still have fun especially the e-bike e really brought the fun back yeah but sometimes it's also a job and there's a lot lots of pressures now and to keep it up on all fronts with all sponsors and all the there's a lot more than just going out and riding you know and i mean some of those guys who are really successful now you know like let, let's just take matt jones and i don't even know what he does on a daily basis but i know he works his ass off mm -hmm. and he's constantly thinking and being creative and burnout you know it's like he's the real deal package to me you know not only is he a racer but he produces content and he goes way beyond world cups into other like yeah, event. Yeah. and and mm -hmm. there is these certain kind of guys but all those guys the one thing they have in common other than like really being really good bike riders you know they, they work their asses off yeah um so yeah and have you been like you know with with money and stuff over the years have you been quite good with managing it and doing like investments and stuff like that Throughout yeah. your career, yeah, I've been pretty smart like a distribution about it. Company as well, you know, cool. I've been pretty smart about. It. I mean, I I had this extra income, like the, because I had I was one of the first guys to bring in these corporate sponsors, like the the Luke clutches and the swatches, and that was kind of nice little extra money mm. that I could like put away and save, and you know, and and but it's it's always like this. I'm sure some people looked at me at being a sellout, having a because like for the BMXers or skaters, it would have been really uncool to have a patch on their jersey, you know. Mm. But then they, they lost out on so much potential income, and at the end of the day, you know, like you you have to pay rent and you have to do this. And some of those guys would sometimes still like sleep in a garage with four other guys, you know, yeah. and and com or at mom's, and 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 I, I remember even in BMX and skate, there came a day when. T-Mobile started sponsoring everybody and, 
and they didn't quite want to put the logo too obvious on so they had like something pink on their helmet and uniform and maybe the T from T-Mobile somewhere but it was like such good money they couldn't turn it down anymore you know and, yeah. and sometimes you have to do these you know if you want to call it sellout it's a sellout thing but I felt like sometimes that guy with all my patches on but hey at the end of the day I was able to buy a house in Laguna Beach and yes I could <laughs> buy it when it was still cheap like 30 years ago but that's like that's how I kind of invested my money, you know. And, awesome. um, but you're also turning up for the for the rads ride every Wednesday. This is what I don't really understand about the sellout, I, and I've never understood it. If you're doing it and you're still doing the sport as hard and as yeah, you know, if you still love it, then it's like impossible to. It's almost impossible to sell out to an extent. Okay, I understand. <laughs> I was just imagining being dressed up as a hot dog as I said it. <laughs> <laughs> What's that water I can call that we're drinking? <laughs> Liquid. <laughs> but I think anything that like leaves like makes it easier for you to just go riding every day is like if I I'd run a clutch company if it meant I could go riding in Laguna every day. You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's it, just a funny It's yeah. a balancing with everything, even the lifestyle, you know. I was never, you know, I trust me I could party, but I was also I would get up the next morning and train and practice and write and and like you know like you have to have this discipline and sometimes you may be not too cool because you didn't you weren't the last guy closing down the party or so you know there's always I mean that's kind of actually a stupid example but but um, there is you know there's it's always a compromise whatever you yeah, do and understand. all the decisions and and yeah so how do you look after your body now was it is it different do you do more Stuff away from the bike. I have this beer and wine diet. Yeah, I've been trying to perfect. <laughs> <laughs> is that going to be? Is, is that going to be a heavy? Uh, is that going to make a heavy appearance in March for the tour? Look, I'm not the poster boy for you know the most fit guy in my age, but I'm you know what I learned is you you can't stop. You have to keep go doing it, and sometimes it's hard yeah. because it gets harder, and you have like pains, and you cannot even maybe do certain things anymore but if you stop it's 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 then it's it gets so much harder to, to come back and you mm -hmm. know you want to come back even though if you burned out temporarily yeah so you have to kind of keep going i think and and uh, note to myself i have to remind that <laughs> remember that sometimes you know but but um yeah it's i try to stay you know relatively healthy and you know and mm. eat and i got some good things to do in laguna Walking on the beach, swimming, that sort of stuff. It was pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's a place to stay healthy, I think, and look good. Yeah, pretty cool. yeah, definitely. There's definitely plenty of, of those kind of activities mm. that one can do. And um, we're going to go for a ride in a bit. Uh, we're gonna, are you up for it? If we got the bike fixed. Yeah, let's see if that's saying right. Well, it's, yeah, well, if there's a time, yeah. We've got a ride. We've got a ride with hands, Ray. <laughs> All right. All right. Got to get those tires dirty, right? Absolutely. Tell us about the tour. Where do we get tickets? What are the dates? Where are we going? I know you've already talked about it. It's good to recap. So you yeah. you can go to the Hans Ray website or Speakers from the Edge website and you find all the tour dates there. The 16 cities. It's throughout the UK and um, you can book right there in the theater, get your seats. And we have meet and greets at, at, every, at every event afterwards. And we have some merchandise we sell. We have free posters for uh, everybody who, can, who wants one and, and all that. So, and, and yeah, hopefully should be entertaining, you know, telling some stories, so showing some footage and films that haven't really been shown much. Sick. Some of it, some of it you've seen, I'm sure. But um, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I bet. I, I still have to practice. I have one week left. Oh, you know, you're in the mirror. <laughs> these things are hard work, these <laughs> talks. You know, I'm a bit nervous. Yeah, I bet, dude. Well, are you going? I'm definitely gonna go. I'm but going. When's the Andover one? That's the March 5th, that's the first one. Fifth, and then okay. we have Christchurch, and then what's it called, Turnbridge down here? Or? Turnbridge? Tumbridge, Tumbridge, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, I might, I'm, I'm, I think Andover is probably the one I'll be going to. Buxton, so I think I'll be at. Right. Nice, nice. Big up Buxton, massive. Yeah, I'll be there. Let me know. Give yeah. me a text. Yeah, and maybe we can go for a ride around there if you want, if you're up for a around Sheffield. Yeah, yeah, maybe we can do something. Dude, many, many thanks for coming on. It's been amazing. I've loved this. It's been really cool. Huh? Insane. So good. Yeah. Good talking Very with you guys. You guys, you know, like you guys living the, living the lifestyle of mountain biking and bringing it out there and making it fun. Hell yeah. Appreciate Thanks, that. Love try it. It means a lot. Yeah. Cool. You're the man. Thank right. you, everyone. We appreciate you. Please buy a ticket. Go see Hans. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. Peace and love.
Well done. Okay. Okay. Hey, man, what an episode that was. You did amazing in it. And so did you. You shone like a star. You shone like a moon. Can we also put something up here that you can click yeah. on for the next episode? How about we put a subscribe up there in the middle? Yeah, love We're going to put a video we think that our uh, lovely companionship yeah. will love yeah. on your face. On oh, my face? Yeah. So and they on can't my, see me now. Gone. And on my face, another video that we think people will love. And thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please hit like and subscribe. You guys are the best. Peace and love.